uh, people who come in can start later. But so this is how we will be taking the attendance in the second year. So there is a short answer question that you should be able to see if you open the room. And actually already 15 people gave answers. So you just have to type that code, that's it. That code right there. Okay, so this is how it looks for me. Okay, so as you are typing, stuff will come here. Uh, the true false ones will actually be more fun. By the way, does this help? Are we able to hear you any better? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So two days. So they will be saying that sometime after singularity, the audio visual systems will start working without problems. So until then, we basically will take weeks to just make AV systems work. Yeah. Not yet. I, I only gave you one question right now. So the question that's currently there is the attendance question. And just so you know, when 1.30 starts, I mean, when, when it becomes 1.30, we'll, I'll start the lecture allowing for you know stragglers to come in, because after all, I was a straggler uh, all the previous two days. And uh, at some point of time, I'll close the attendance question, and then we will do the true false questions. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No. You should be. No, they just. No, I think just the. We just had the one question. There should have been only one question. That's an attendance question. If you are not correct. There are about 84 people who answered whether they're here or not. Apparently. Um, anyway, we'll see.
I don't know how many of you have watched this amazing movie, but really it has a holy grail for our teaching and I want to show you that before we start. That's the holy grail we are looking for. The teacher is in those days a big school tape recorder. Sit over here. And the students, of course, are the small micro tape recorders. Um, unfortunately, this class is old fashioned. We actually are expecting fashion, but people to be here. But really, that's what we should be eventually graduating to. So the middle men, middle women are cut out. Computers teach, computers learn, and we will be out somewhere. Um, in some planet. Anyway, how many of you have seen Real Genius? Okay. <laughs> There's a long weekend coming, right? Watch Real Genius. Yes. Well, they will all come slowly. Today's assignment is Real Genius. Um, you can always catch up on our Seinfeld, that should be fine too. Okay, so we have 119 answers. So those of you who came in late, uh, please note that we are taking attendance. So if you go into the Socrative uh, app uh, that I told you about, uh, there should be one question asking what's the attendance code for today. That's that. Have one. Okay. Just type that, and that way we know uh, that you're actually here. And then we will also use this, not just for this, but for other things, more useful things like uh, true-false questions, etc. Okay. That's kind of interesting. There are 79 people logged in, and 125 answers. I'm not quite sure. You have to figure this out slowly. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Okay, so we will get to this in a few minutes, but you probably talk about it, we'll talk about it a little bit um, in, um, in, uh, in uh, sequence. Um, actually, let me just see if I can also get on to... So we, you should, there was a mail that was sent today, there are two important mails that were sent. One, obviously, if you didn't know, you would not know what's going on about this attendance code. You're all supposed to have um, the, you're supposed to have the uh, Socrative um, installed. Um, and then the second is that the grade scope, you're all being sent grade scope um, uh, registration instructions. So you should set it up so that you will be able to submit your project, etc. Okay? So those are the two important things uh, that, that happened. Is there uh, too much? Okay. Okay, so what, is this still okay? Back, okay. So what we're going to do today essentially is mostly go through what you have read um, somewhat uh, quickly and then um, add some a few additional things to bring it uh, up to date in terms of how what the course is doing compares to what you probably thought uh, any AI course should be doing if you only cared about uh, classification learning. Which is, which is the stuff, supervised learning has been the stuff that's been um, making a lot of um, uh, headway everywhere. So you may have thought about that, so I want to kind of give you a sense of how the course uh, uh, focus connects to, as well as differs from somebody who might just be interested in machine learning. Clearly it's not just a machine learning course that you already uh, hopefully uh, made clear. Um, so, 
uh, you saw in the in the um, stuff that you read uh, in, in the chapter that you read that we're trying to make an intelligent agent. Um, essentially, everything is an intelligent agent. Of course, I drew this pink robot, uh, which is my kind of the talisman. I kind of drew it a million years back, and I keep using it. But uh, in general, it could be a program. It could be a cyber entity. It doesn't have to be an embodied entity at all. Okay. The real question, of course, is any agent is sort of interacting with an environment, and we sort of try to talk about the properties of the environment. And the kinds of things that the agent can do is it can it has some effectors, what we call actions, and it uses those effectors to make changes to the environment. Okay, if it doesn't have any effectors, then it's just an observer. Notice that agents can be observers. In fact, there are some cases where the agent only wants to learn what's going on in the world, doesn't want to behave at all in the world. But the most general case, an agent essentially wants to change the environment in some ways that will make its goals be achieved which brings up this issue of what are its goals. So it has some performance metric or some goals that it's trying to achieve. Um, and uh, it's trying to make sure that it is doing the actions that on the whole, in the long term, try to maximize its performance metric. Okay, now of course, as it does some actions, it basically changes, possibly it changes the environment. And it gets to see what the current state of the environment is. How does the environment look right now? Okay. And the see basically is like a general word. It can see, it can feel, it can touch, it can measure, it can do any kind of observations on the environment. And these observations are what are giving it some sort of a snapshot of the current state of the environment. And one of the most interesting things that you read, of course, is, is the environment fully observable or partially observable? Is it fully observable means you get every bit of the environment. You know the complete information about the environment. So you actually know the exact state the environment is in. Okay, the word state is going to be bandied about a lot, but in fact, the state can be essentially description in some formal way of all the things that hold in the environment. Okay, so it's actually useful to understand that this is a really, really, really general view. Okay, there is nothing you could think of uh, that would somehow not fit into this view. So, in particular, your lives fit into this view. You, hopefully, are an intelligent agent. And you are dealing with an environment. And you have some actions. Okay? And you are able to observe what effect those, that those have on the environment. Now, in general, of course, normal, general intelligent agents, it's essentially life. Okay, what's your goal in life? Um, that's extremely, becomes much harder and also whether or, it's very hard to also tell whether or not you're reached. So sometimes you might actually consider a smaller domain. For example, you are the 471 intelligent agent. Okay, and the 471 intelligent agent basically has the classroom as the environment. Okay, and, uh, and basically the kinds of tests, etc., that the environment might be giving tests to it and they have, you have to do well in them. Okay, and so you are constantly asking yourself, how am I doing in the course? People keep asking, how do I get into Canvas? How do I get into this? How do I get into that? I need to know what my current grade is. As if somehow that's connected to your final grade. But you feel that you should know whether you're already falling behind or not. So presumably, you're trying to get some sort of an observation about your environment by looking at your partial grades, etc. Okay, now is your, what's your goal? In 471, presumably, the optimal goal that I hope you all have is understand AI. But what you really have is get an A+. Plus. That's it. You don't really care whether you understand or not. I mean, so you have a particular performance metric. So in fact, one of the interesting questions that we will talk about is designing a performance metric 
is often external. In fact, for humans, we set ourselves sometimes performance metrics. But in most cases, in fact, there was a question on this in, in Piazza too. In most cases, it's simplest to assume that the performance metric has been input by the designer. So in this case, I'm the designer of the class. So I input a performance metric. Okay, so I have to make sure that the kind of performance metric I am inputting is actually connected to what I hope you will get out of this course. Okay, there are these beautiful, I think the Peter's principle, I believe, Hart's, Peter Hart's principle or something which says, when a measure becomes a goal, it loses its effectiveness as a measure. Grades are a measure of your understanding. But when it becomes the goal, then you could actually forget about understanding, copy somebody's stuff, and then get a grade. And then you have cut out of the actual real performance metric. This may sound kind of only related to this class, but in fact, now that everybody is worried about AI agents taking over and might potentially misinterpret the performance metric that has been given to them. Okay, there is a very important question as to how do we make sure that the performance metric that we give actually captures what it is that we want the agent to do. Okay, the most obvious one that Stuart Russell has been uh, going about talking about is King Midas. How many of you know of King Midas? The the, uh, the legend. So King Midas basically essentially um, has sort of, you know, did lots of, I guess, uh, prayers or something, and he got a boon from the gods. And, and what he said basically was, what was a boon? He asked, okay, I just want to make sure that anything I touch becomes gold. That was his performance metric to set for himself. And the gods said, sure. Okay, and then of course you know the rest of the story. Then basically he tries to eat stuff, the stuff becomes gold, unfortunately we can't digest gold. He tries to kiss his kid, kid becomes gold, gold is not a kid anymore, it is dead. Lots and lots of fun stuff and the guy is really, really unhappy. Okay, this is basically what he actually could have said, what, what uh, King Midas could have said to the guards, is guards have some common sense, okay? When I say everything I touch should become gold, I didn't ask you to take it literally. Okay? You should have some sense of what people like us like. We don't like our kids to become gold. We don't like our you know, hamburger to become gold. We want like anything else that we touch, like this table might become gold. That's a useful thing. Have common sense. And of course, God didn't want to have common sense. God wanted to teach this guy a lesson. Now imagine the same kind of a situation. There's another guy called Nick Bostrom, who is basically has been trying to argue that we should all be running to the hills because super intelligence is about to come and it's going to kill us all. And with my the respectful tone I'm using to describe him, you know that I kind of respect him a lot. Um, <laughs> so the kinds of things that he says, for example, is he uses this um, another example called a paperclip agent. So this is the second time we heard of paperclips in this class. The first time, of course, is the paperclip uh, uh, which became pushy. Uh, whoever put that uh, uh, SNL sketch, that's exactly the sketch I had in mind. I was watching it again yesterday. It's hilarious. Um, so the paperclip issue is, suppose you have an intelligent agent, which has significant capabilities. It can do lots and lots of things by itself. And it comes and says, hey, what do you want me to do? And you say, I, we need that paper clips. Now the guy says, uh, how many paper clips? Uh, no more, the better. That's like a reasonable thing. Like you want to say, I want to be rich. How rich? Is it the more money, the better? That's like a reasonable thing to say. So um, you might be saying a paperclip agent uh, to the paperclip agent, the more paperclips the better. And so Nick Boston is now worried that this agent will go off because it has infinite capabilities. It has it's a super elite, super intelligent, super capable agent. It will convert everything in sight 
every metal object inside into paper clips. So you will then be drowning in paper clips. And then you're trying to say, enough, 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 but then of course it's just too busy making paper clips. This is kind of a useful thing to think of in the sense that if you're actually providing a performance metric, every performance metric is incomplete. Every performance metric is incomplete. Okay, and we complete them using, in some sense, common sense knowledge among our results. Do you see what I'm saying? And one of the issues, of course, is if the AI agents don't have common sense, they may well take your performance metric in a literal sense, just like God took Midas' uh, request in a literal sense, and then that would not be what you hope for. So you wanted something, you said something else which you thought could be equivalent, and it was basically misinterpreted. Because this incompletely unsaid stuff was completed in a different way by the agent. So if God can do it, AI agents can do it. So this is a worry that you do have to have. And in fact, if any time, if you, you know, if especially your <coughs> philosophy friends, if when they hear you, uh, when they hear that you're taking intro to AI, they'll say, hey, what about these paper clips? Are they going to take over the world or not? Are you going to drown in that? And you shouldn't look like they have paper clips. You should say, you know, whatever I just told you. Okay, especially Madras and etc. And they say, gods themselves cannot complete common sense queries. So where do you think AI can do it right now? But anyway, so that's sort of the goal that it has. For in the beginnings, we'll assume that taking the goals literally is correct. Okay, but then we realize that sometimes actually you have to uh, add common sense knowledge to the goal so that it actually will be interpreted correctly. Right? Everything. So in fact, you realize that this is true in general um, across the board because, like for example, I say, I hope you won't have a life and you just focus on this course. And if you all die by the end of this weekend, I will have zero people attending this class. I mean, there are other problems too, but in general, that would not be what I'm expecting. Right? I'm expecting that you understood what I said. You have competing goals, and you just realized by what I'm saying that I really want you to spend as much time as you can, but come on, once in a while take a shower, once in a while sleep, okay? Once in a while say hello to your friends. This stuff is kind of needed. Okay? So I'm assuming that you have the common sense to complete them correctly. That's what everybody assumes. People give you lots and lots of goals, and if you take them all literally, you'll be there. Okay? Anyway, so that's basically the intelligent agent specification. And then what the agent needs to do is what action should I do next? In a most general scenario, an agent can have multiple competing goals. And it's trying to figure out, based on all those goals, what should be its next action. And then its performance metric, essentially, is not what happens right then to the environment. But really, it has to be, over a long period of time, what states did the environment go through. And that state sequence is what you're going to evaluate, saying, is it a good state sequence or not. It's the same thing, like Jeffrey Epstein had a great life. He was giving money to Harvard, he was giving money to MIT, he was giving money to everybody who would take his money. But will you remember that he was a good guy? No. He had many, 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 many great states in his life. But the state sequence, unfortunately, ended in him hanging himself uh, you know, with or without help. Um, <laughs> I don't want to stop any conspiracy theorists in this class. If you are interested in conspiracy theorists, I will help you. Um, so, the, my point, of course, is the secret. So, if you consider Jeffrey Epstein's life, like up until maybe 2008, you'd say a successful life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Performance really is like that. This is the same thing. If you don't care about, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, if you have money and you are putting it in the stock market, then I don't know why you're taking this course, first of all. If you have money and you can put it in the stock market, but assuming you have it, right? What are you trying to do? 
overall you're trying to increase presumably over a long period of time you're trying to increase your returns. If you do something that triples the money tomorrow and then you continue doing that strategy that makes it zero day after tomorrow, are you supposed to have a successful or failure? Once again, my point is performance is the sequence of the states through which the environment has gone through. It's not obvious unless you have thought about it before. And if it's not obvious to you, you should realize that the value of your life doesn't depend on a single state that you've gone through. The value of the life really is the life. It's all the states that you have gone through. And there is some function that I will apply and then say, yeah, yes, it's the value of your life is 15.79 cubic units. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with the flawed environment? What do you mean flawed environment? Something that's constantly changing doesn't stay the same. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, that's not flawed environment. That's just environment. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, nobody owes you anything. Do you see what I'm saying? The world is not out there. I don't know. It's possible that we somehow think that somehow we are the chosen ones. The world is supposed to help us. The world doesn't care about us. Sometimes it will actually try to, some people in the world might try to cooperate with you, some people in the world might try to, um, you know, be adversarial with you. Just as the world, inorganic, inanimate world, doesn't care about you. So, you just have, to, if you want to live in that world, you can either stabilize that world, that is by yourself a little bubble in which everything is nice, and stay in that bubble. We do that. I mean, how are we living in Arizona? <laughs> right? Right? I mean, you can say, bad world, man. What is this? You know, this summer stuff is bad. And how are East Coast people living in the East Coast in, some, in winter when all of you guys will see them totally under you know, snow instead of uh, paper clips? <laughs> right? <laughs> how do they do it? They stabilize their environment. They bought little, little you know, rooms which are temperature controlled and they just hang around there. You could do that. And in fact, sometimes that's the right thing to do. In fact, a classic case is every time that I see that a kid found a gun in the home and either killed himself or herself or killed hopefully the parents who left them there, <laughs> I think this is stupidity. You know, irrespective of whether you care about it, you know, whatever amendments, etc., that you care about. It makes no sense to have guns left unattended in the room. Why not also have a few really deep holes in the living room? <laughs> and then write in, like, you know, when the two-year-old is going around, just put, like, you know, some sort of a LED light saying, you know, there's a hole, don't fall into it. And then you come back, you'll see that the hole, obviously the kid is in that hole. <laughs> if you don't stabilize, right, then you basically own the environment. That's the environment that you are, that you put that age in. So sometimes we do have to stabilize. So in fact, everything here, this little picture captures that too. In trying to increase your overall success, you may well in the beginning start building bridges in the environment, or building air conditioning units in the environment, or building something else in the environment. And then after that, start working on the immediate goal. That too is correct. And in fact, those are the harder problems to solve. Where, so this is the most general life kind of a scenario. You could have agents where all they need to do is one decision and they're out. That would be the least interesting kind of an agent. Imagine you create a human, they just make one decision, out they are. I mean, that means it doesn't matter to us, you know, their entire life is just based on the single disconnected decisions. Do you understand what I just said? Your life depends on everything you do today, more or less might impact what you will do later on. They are not tightly connected, but they are connected in some sense. If everything you do is completely independent of everything that happens, that you get to do tomorrow, day after, etc., life would be much simpler, but it will also be much less interesting. 
If you believe that, if you agree with that, realize that a simple classification learning agent, which is the one that got most of you to this class, which is this cat, okay, this dog, okay, those are the decisions that this agent will be making. If you're right or wrong, or you see, and I'm suppose in fact it turns out that based on what you said about the class, something else is done, something else is done, and then there are additional ramifications of that. Learning agent doesn't care about it. It just looks at the classification accuracy. So those are essentially one-shot decision agents. Those are the least interesting agents. They, their life is hard too sometimes, but those are the least interesting <coughs> agents. The more interesting agents are the ones where they do sequential decisions. They keep on acting, acting, acting. Acting never stops. Now, acting, not acting in the movies, but doing actions to the world, in the world. It never stops until you die. Do you see what I'm saying? And that, given that, figuring out how to you know, maximize the performance metric is a much harder problem. Just Jeffrey Epstein actually won many, many small problems. Like, you know, if you put yourself a goal, I want to go to White House and get a photograph taken with whoever is there. He's done that. He's done a whole bunch of those kinds of things. But as a life, basically he failed. According to most of you, I'm not saying this, but if you believe that, then you realize that it's a much harder problem to do sequential decision making than just one off decision making. So if you ask yourself any time in the middle of the class, what's the difference between this and a classification learner? It just basically says, OK, this guy should be given a loan. This guy should not be given a loan. And doesn't matter what happens after that. Anything is wrong, the humans in the loop, or the rest of the people in the loop, basically take the, the, uh, the burden. It's not like the agent's performance is somehow affected. The agent is basically given a score, saying you are right. 76 out of 100 times. That's a much simplistic agent than something more general like your life. Okay? And everything is captured in this. This little picture. That's why it's worth understanding. Okay? In fact, from now onwards, anytime you see a problem, any AI problem, any non-AI problem, you will ask yourself, what's the environment? What are the kinds of actions? What kind of observations are possible? What's the goal performance metric? And you learn a huge amount on, about the problem, just by asking. And you also be able to see that many people will find the simpler cases, which happen to you know, tend to have commercial applications, and just focus on them. It's not that 